thanks for joining us again and welcome back. I have to say I'm still very much energized from the networking session. I had the pleasure of meeting some of you in our networking session, which just ended earlier. And even if it was not physical, I have to say it really feels good to chat to people outside of pre-scheduled Teams or Zooms or whatever uh, platform you're using meetings. We are now coming to the climax of our Solar Power Summit. The solar sector is growing exponentially and the figures have been mentioned throughout the Solar Power Summit. You have heard them several times. If you have had a look at our 2050 study, you will have seen that solar can cover 60%, uh, up to 60% of all our energy needs by then, by 2050. If, if, <laughs> and that's a big if, political leaders follow the most cost efficient path. With great power comes great responsibility, as our president Aristoteles Chantavas mentioned in the opening speech. Driving sustainable change is therefore not just the motto of this summit, but will be really guiding us in all our further work as a red line. This is not completely new, as Solar Power Europe has been working on sustainability for quite a while. What started just as an environmental footprint task force has been turned into the sustainability work stream, covering in particular subjects like carbon footprint, circularity, biodiversity, acceptance, human rights and supply chain transparency. As Solar Power Europe, we want to support and steer sought leadership in sustainability. And that is not because we, we are lacking behind, on the very contrary. But as the most sustainable energy source, obviously together with wind, solar should become a sustainability champion in all aspects. We have a very ambitious program ahead of us for the next years. So please stay tuned and, you, and, and uh, expect to hear from us in the months to come on sustainability. But I am particularly proud that we will be presenting our first edition of the Solar Sustainability Best Practice Benchmark to you in the next session. A very special thanks goes to all the members of the Sustainability Workstream who have been working very hard uh, together with us to put this together. But in particular, I would like to thank Raffaele Rossi, our senior policy advisor, who has been leading the work. For now, I am handing over to Michael Schmeller, our executive advisor and head of market intelligence, to steer the next panel discussion on solar for sustainability. Michael, the floor is yours, and I'm very much looking forward to the discussions. Thank you, Valborga. Thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, so as you already said, um, some, some might ask why, why we need to look at sustainability in the solar sector, which is uh, as a product made, mostly made of, of sand and glass and does so much good for our climate. Um, but obviously it's an industrial product and solar means more than just the modules with implications on the environment before, during, and obviously also after its life. And as we're just, uh, as Valburga just mentioned, at the start of the journey that will make solar at least as we foresee it, the largest power generation source on this planet, it's really time for us, for the sector, to, to make its sustainability homework. So really start early. And that's why we at Solar Power um, are having, um, have, have been looking at this, this topic for quite a while and having also now a work stream on, on, on solar sustainability, as, as Valborga mentioned. And that's also why we just came out now with this, uh, with this new report that was launched today. And I think what, what I would like to do is, I think I would like to have with our panelists um, um, guide you all through this report, which you can also download on our website and, and discuss um, what's in there. So, but let, let me just um, first um, introduce briefly our panelists. So first, I'm very happy to, with us, to have with us Susanna Wood. 
She is uh, Vice President Public Affairs European Wind and Solar at Stadtkraft. That's very new. She holds that position since May 2021. So congratulations. However, Susanna has not changed actually jobs. She's, she's still with Solar Century, uh, UK's leading solar developer and EPC. What has changed? Solar Century is now part of Stadtkraft and the new name of the company is simply Stadtkraft. Susanna has been for with Solar Century for 14 years, uh, worked there as chief marketing officer among other positions, and um, she's also a board member at Solar Power Europe. Welcome, Susanna. We're also very happy to have with us um, Jun Lu, who holds a PhD in nanotechnology and material science, and she's the co-founder and CEO of Rosy Solar, a French-based technology startup in the solar recycling field, a very important topic we will discuss about. And, um, and, and, and Jun has also quite some experience when we just uh, pre-discussed here on the panel. Um, I think none of us has less than 13 years of solar experience. Um, so Rosie has been, among others, um, working for Swift Integrator 3S, which later was taken over by Maya Burger, which is now turning into a solar cell and module manufacturer. So, so the, the circle's always close at solar somehow. Um, it's also wonderful to have with us uh, Andreas Wade, whose professional solar life has been pretty much focused on sustainability already at the time probably few others thought about that he was already the coordinator for pv cycle activities at q cells in 2008 he was also responsibility for sustainability at q cells thin film subsidiary calixo before he joined then first solar in 2011 where he's now the company's global sustainability director Andreas um, has been also a driving force in this field at Solar Power Europe for many, many years, and he's currently the chair of our sustainability work stream. Welcome, Andreas. And then, where I'm also personally very happy to have with us Paul Wormser, who I know for decades. Um, welcome to the US, um, from the US. Um, and, um, Paul is the VP Technology at Clean Energy Associates, um, which is a leading consultancy firm um, in the field of transparent, transparency, product sourcing. Um, and um, Paul has already worked in the 1990s. I was uh, pretty impressed when I once went through his uh, LinkedIn profile for then very famous US cell and module manufacturer ASE Americas, which some of you might remember, turned later on into RWE, Short Solar. And in the meantime, he also worked for lead, at le in leading positions at Conarca, Sharp, Res Solar, Sun Edison, before he joined CEA in 2017. So great panel, very excited to have you all. I think we're also, it's, it's really also a nice, um, nice setup. So to put it simple, so um, when, we, when we go basically through the structure of the panel, the idea of this panel will be simply to look at solar sustainability from different angles. While we have on the one hand a manufacturer like First Solar bringing the solar product in the market, it's companies like Stadtkraft using it and trying to source the right and sustainable and high quality product. And they do that with the help of consultancies like CEA, while in the end it's Rosie as a tech provider that's helping to close the circle after the life of a solar module and other products end. As we have um, just launched our sustainability report, Andreas will summarize the key findings before we start with the panel. Andreas, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Michael, for the kind introduction. And yes, I'm very grateful to have such a great panel today here. 
um, for this sort of for sustainability session. And yeah, as, as you mentioned, we, we just launched our first edition best practice benchmark from the sustainability work stream. And uh, just to frame a little bit the panel and, and the discussion, um, I have, you know, selected a couple of, you know, chapters from that report. I can't go through it in, in, in full detail since, um, as you can imagine, there's, you know, so many different dimensions and angles on sustainability, which we try to highlight in the report that I just, you know, selected three um, references here. But before going into these and, and explaining you the structure of the report, um, may, maybe one, one, one additional word word on, on why I think this is so crucially important. And it basically reflects what, what Balborga has said at the beginning, right? I mean, we are all part of, of a technology family which is providing the ultimate commodity, right, electricity. And um, with the ongoing focus on and, and the increasing focus on the um, sustainability profile of these electrons, which are basically, you know, can be seen in any of the products which are made out of these electrons, any of the services which will be provided, be it cloud computing services, be it transportation services, be it power to X, um, you, you, can, you can just imagine what is going to happen over the next couple of years in this exponential growth. It is ultimately important that we are taking responsibility for the sustainability profile of these electrons, which manifests themselves into, you know, the different life cycle stages we are, we are looking into and the different dimensions of sustainability. And that's really the purpose of that best practice benchmark report that we wanted to showcase to our stakeholders that, hey, we are ready for that challenge of, you know, becoming uh, uh, one of the two major pillars for the future electricity generation for this planet. Um, and hence, um, we are embarking on that and embracing that responsibility and take accountability for for these sustainability aspects and that's that's really what this is this is this is meant to be um, and uh, obviously it will will be a continuous journey as we as we evolve in, in the technology so going to the next slide um, maybe I can just you know highlight a couple of uh, uh, points which which I already you know um, refer to um, again. So we will deliver um, more than sixty percent of Euro Europe's electricity by twenty fifty, and it's it's far from being a flat curve, right? I mean, sector coupling, all these other things which will come in, will increase will lead to increased electrification. So that that's really um, important, and just just the sheer. Um, you know, growth rate we can see um, if you think about how long it took to get the first 500 gigawatts produced and installed, um, which took almost 60 years. Um, the second 500 only took six years and for a terawatts will follow in this decade, right? So that just explains the importance of, of getting this right and understanding um, all the impacts along the life cycle of this technology and that is really what we are trying to highlight in this report that um, these multiple dimensions are taken into consideration and that we are trying to address those proactively and accountable to really um, be um, uh, yeah, a kind of the representative for for this new um, tech for this uh, technology which is so crucially important for uh, ensuring the sustainable development until the mid of this century so let me let me highlight a couple of of these um, chapters we were we were looking into in this best practice benchmark. If you can go to the next slide, please. So as you can see, um, and and Valborga already introduced that a little bit. Um, what we tried to cover um, really were multiple dimensions stretching from the environmental. Um, baseline, um, looking into the carbon footprint, the circularity, so resource efficiency and materials use, um, then more generally in a sustainable supply chain. So what, what kind of, you know, are we taking up um, in, in the manufacturing, in the deployment um, in, in, across various dimensions? Biodiversity was another um, aspect we wanted to shed a light on, since that is one of the major topics which we are being faced with in deploying these technologies um, in, in large scale facilities. Um, so what, what can solar actually do in that regard to, to be responsible and also enhance biodiversity? So that was one aspect. And then obviously also planning and designing for public acceptance, um, a very important um, topic 
which we which we explained and, and provide case studies on as um yeah the, the amount of change which will come over the next couple of years will require a broad buy-in from the stakeholder base which will be affected so public acceptance and and the social license to operate will be crucially to maintain then last but not least um we obviously also touched upon um the topic of human rights um and then basically the social dimension um of sustainability and then also um, the governance aspect, which again, I think is also crucially important in reporting and transparency to ensure that that we are as transparent as we can be for this important technology. So um, I have I have chosen just to introduce the panel um, three topics, um, which I just wanted to give you a flavor on how this report is structured. Um, and again, please um, download it on the website of Solar Power Europe. I think it's, it's a very valuable resource to use in your day-to-day -day practice as well. So if you go to the next slide, you can actually yeah click 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 one further um then uh yeah just to explain a little bit what we have tried to do when looking at the carbon footprint um uh each each of the chapters in the report is structures in 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 kind of explaining the approaches and best practices um uh, for that specific aspect and then provide case studies to really give a real world um uh, view on you know what is the state of the art and what is ongoing in terms of innovating and further improving there um and so i, I won't go through it in in all detail but but as you can see um uh, the, the, the topic of life cycle thinking and thinking through the different steps of the supply chain the manufacturing process the deployment and then also end of life and recycling it's been uh, kind of the, the, the red thread which goes through the whole report. Um, so we also try to understand, okay, what approaches are available in each of these phases and what are the dimensions of impact? So starting from energy efficiency and energy consumption um, uh, in the production process, um, uh, obviously low carbon electricity in the supply chain, uh, transportation, um, considerations of efficiencies and emissionality considerations with regard to residual grid mixes. So all these aspects are basically highlighted there and, and uh, put together. And as, as you can see already, um, uh, you know, solar together with wind, the two major um, uh, renewable technologies providing that base load in the future um, are already coming with a very low carbon footprint. But nevertheless, um, we see an increasing interest from stakeholders to understand, okay, what is the embodied carbon and what can be done to further improve that? And I think the industry is showing um, that we that we are in a great great way to to really get to very very low embodied carbon um, emissions in the in the in the materials we use. Um, and this is exemplified in the case studies which are mentioned in the um, in the report on polysilicon production, wafer production, cells and modules, and also thin film solar um, modules. So that, that's one chapter we obviously focused on. Uh, and then if you go to the next slide, the, the other one I wanted to quickly highlight really um, is on circularity. Um, so this, this topic has also gained a lot of um, momentum uh, in the stakeholder discussions, but also in the regulatory space, um, because, yeah, as, as, as we just learned, right, the uh, deployment rates we are going to see over the next couple of years will also mean that we will have a lot of equipment out there, billions and billions of these devices, uh, which um, can be deployed in small scale installations, large scale installations, highly decentralized, centralized. So taking accountability for the materials used in these panels and then ensuring that we recover them at end of life um, and, and recycle them or reuse them or repair them is obviously uh, an, a very important aspect that we see in fact more and more regulators jumping on that discussion as well. So we wanted to show that the industry actually is looking proactively into developing strategies to address that material circular economy renewable energy nexus proactively. So from de design for recycling approaches, um, alternatives assessments to substitute hazardous materials, optimization of collection practices and information and established networks, reuse and repair. Um, that's that's things we, we have all, you know, showcased uh, here as approaches and then as you can see a very high number of case studies as well to just show that there is a lot of momentum building on this also within the industry and then maybe last but not least a quick highlight on the uh, the third uh, the third chapter i picked out of the report um if you can go to the next slide 
um, is, is human rights. And as, as we have um, yeah, seen over the last couple of weeks and months, that topic has gained quite a bit of attention uh, and obviously carries quite a significant risk for the whole you know, value chain and technology family if we can't get this right and address this upfront with the necessary accountability and required transparency which, which has to be done to ensure that we have um, human rights due diligence in our supply chain and across the value chain, um, as well as, you know, improving that transparency. So it was very important uh, for, for the Workstream members. And again, thanks to all of, the, all of the experts who have contributed to that to really show, okay, there is no need for the industry to reinvent the wheel. Um, we have seen these discussions happening on human rights due diligence in many, many, many other sectors over the last couple of years. And in fact, there are very um, robust protocols available like the responsible um, uh, business uh, alliance rba uh, responsible labor initiative um, there are validated audit protocols available there are iso standards um, available there is an sa 8000 international standard on social accountability so we just wanted to make sure to display that and and really give um, or highlight, you know, how the industry, which in a way is still fairly young, if you compare it to other established industries, can leverage these networks and can make sure that we that we tackle this um, up front and with the required transparency and accountability to ensure that we remain on a sustainable trajectory as an industry. And again, the case studies we are portraying here uh, give a great example on, on you know, what, what can be done and what, what we can improve to address some of the concerns which have been voiced recently. So I think that that's really what I wanted to highlight as an introduction to this session. And I'm, I'm very much looking forward now to exchange with the, with the colleagues um, uh, in, the, in the panel here on, on a couple of questions in this regard. And yeah, hand it back to you, Michael. Thank you. Thanks for the nice introduction uh, for the nice overview, Andreas. So, so let's let's start with you as a, as a module manufacturer and then look at also maybe a little bit more in detail at carbon footprint at first. So um, while for solar is uh, is obviously uh, you know it's a little bit the sector a poster child uh, in 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 this regard, uh, being a vertically integrated company that's using a technology that allows also to have components basically simplified in and final module out after a few hours. Um, this is somewhat different, of course, for the bulk of solar crystalline silicon. So can you, can you please provide some more background on, on carbon footprint of solar, um, also compared to others along the value chain? And, um, and I, maybe actually also, at least that's uh, what I see sometimes, um, why actually solar should theoretically or actually look better than what we find in literature. And what what's the way forward here, um, to hopefully get to 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 lower um, numbers? Sure. Yeah. Happy happy to to give a comment on that. And um, yeah, as as you rightly say, I mean, uh, the, the perception of solar as as a green technology option with with uh, virtually no carbon emissions is slowly changing as as we see international reporting frameworks evolve in the context of non-financial reporting um where you know buyers of electricity start looking increasingly at, at the so-called scope three emissions and that that's kind of where the, the focus is moving towards okay what is the embodied carbon right and um that's that that's some a trend we have seen over the last couple of years and that's also where we as a solar industry can further improve by looking at you know holistic life cycle assessment and then understanding okay what are the levers we can still or the, the knobs we can still turn to reduce the embodied carbon um, and make sure that um, we achieve a high rate of um, carbon mitigation efficiency if i might call it that way right so the lower our embodied carbon footprint is the faster we can actually make a positive impact on um, uh, displacing carbon emissions from residual grids, right? So that, that's probably the motivation why there has been a, a lot of focus on that. And actually, if, if you look at the hotspots which, which are there, you can, you can clearly see that a significant hotspot, no matter which technology, is the supply chain of electricity. So basically, um, the electricity you need to deploy to manufacture the components, the raw materials, and then the final module, um, that obviously comes with a with the residual carbon footprint, and obviously with with greening grids, that that will get lower. 
but we can accelerate that, right? And and, and some companies have, have shown that by committing to 100% renewable sourcing in the RE100 initiative um, and are deploying practices like, uh, you know, high value recycling, which also is a way to address this by using recycled content, post-consumer or post-industrial recycled content and, and facilitating that. So that that's really uh, one of the things um, we are highlighting in the report and where we see um, there, there is there is improvement potential and actually industry is picking that up. The, the second point you're mentioning, and maybe maybe that that's really an important you know call for action for all our um, viewers today, is that indeed sometimes we face the issue that life cycle inventory data, which is the underlying uh, baseline information we can use to do that kind of assessment and the scope three emissions calculation, for example, is outdated, right? So it's not representative of what is the current state of the art. And that obviously is a problem if, you know, outside third parties look at it and they look at the life cycle database um, like like EcoInvent or others and they find data which is you know 10 years 15 years old and not reflective of what is actually possible today and that that is a challenge for the industry that we need to make sure again in the spirit of being transparent and accountable for for the products we produce and put on the market to update this data and make it available in a validated and transparent uh, way so that people can really judge, okay, this, this is the real footprint I'm dealing with. This is improved. And that's that's how I can calculate my positive impact if I start purchasing electricity from that technology today. So that that's really where I where I see one of the action items for the industry to make sure that these inventories get updated. Okay, yeah, thanks, Andre. So, so we have the product now, and then comes uh, the, de the developer, the EPC, and um, and we come to Susanna. So I think um, Stadtgraf is taking care a, a lot for solar sustainability. So um, that's a, a little hint to the next session. That's a good reason. Uh, you are a finalist in our sustainability awards today. But um, what, what's the main driver for your product purchase department when choosing products? And, and, and I think we have to also look at here um, the cost pressure, which uh, developers uh, have actually, you are all participating in tenders. So, and that's on the one side and on the other side, there's the ambition of, 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 of trying to use a, a product as sustainable, sustainable as possible. So can you, can you just um, shine some light on that? Yes, absolutely. I think one of the things that, that perhaps is a bit different about us is that we are both a developer and we act as the EPC. And what that means is that as an EPC, we're putting everything through our developer lens. We're putting everything through the lens of um, LCOE. So what is it going to do to the levelized cost of electricity for the for this particular project? And actually, that's quite a helpful way of driving some sustainable decisions because if you're looking at the entire project over its 30 year lifespan at the time when you're making a capital purchase decision then you tend to make better decisions i would say so let me give you an example uh, we just built 500 megawatts uh, with trackers and we could have put batteries on, to power the trackers um, across those solar farms but chose not to because they'd have to be replaced every two years. It's wasteful. It's actually, it actually turns out to be more expensive over the lifetime of the project. So we, we made a decision to wire those trackers instead, which was more expensive up front, but better from a kind of cost perspective over the project, but also better from the point of view of minimizing waste. So if you are more focused on the life cycle of the project, you're going to make better decisions about longevity, quality, um, the, you'll pay more for that better warranty for that better product. So I think there is a there's a benefit to um, using LCOE for your procurement decisions. But clearly that's Whilst that's good, it might is not enough. And I think what we need to move towards, as there is more self-consciously ESG type of money coming into the sector, 
um, uh, it would be good to see how that translates into um, a, a, an increased demand for uh, better sustainability within the projects and maybe some kind of price differential for that. Um, that perhaps is uh, naive, but um, it, would be, it would be good to see that coming through in terms of investors' requirements of, of us as a developer, that they, that they value that and they attach a value to, to increasing sustainability in the way that we build these projects. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So, so Paul, you're you're helping companies like um, um, like Stadtkraft and and many other developers, EPCs, actually to 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 really source products from from manufacturers. You have a, a lot of people in China and around the world. So, and and quality is usually the major topic here. And while um, while Susanna simply kind of really pointed at at LCOE, that's one thing. But often we still see okay it's the module product and uh, okay at the moment price went a little bit up because of the shortage in materials we have but uh, usually it's the other way and it's going less and less the margins are getting tighter and uh, thinner so so how how, how important um, are sustainable products to developers across the board at the moment and and what are the main differences you're seeing and Thank you, Michael. You know, I, th I think sustainability falls under the larger umbrella of ethical sourcing, which I would suggest is a mega trend that we are all experiencing today. And within ethical sourcing, we're thinking about sustainability. I think sustainability for me and for our customers, which are utility companies, developers, people like Susana, um, and long-term owners, even you know, residential homeowners at the end of the stick, uh, if you will, people care about three elements of sustainability. Absolutely embedded carbon is becoming an issue. I think back to when France first put in some requirements for an embedded carbon analysis before modules would, could be deployed in France. And that was a leading position. Uh, and I would say perhaps the US has lagged in that position, but last year for the first time, I saw the state of New York in a solicitation require the EPCs to do a full life cycle embedded carbon analysis, not with a test of what's good or what's bad, but just raising awareness. So I see that as, as becoming increasingly important. And even to the point where the truck that is used to get the product from point A to point B has a carbon footprint. And now people are starting to talk about the carbon footprint in the logistics side. So we have a long way to go, but I'm encouraged by the attention that we're all putting into embedded carbon. So that's one. The next thing is on materials and the sustainability of materials and where they come from. Are they abundant enough, but also are they sourced and produced in an ethical way? And in the last couple of years, I think anybody who's had a conversation about solar has also had a conversation about storage so storage materials and cobalt and where it comes from and the ethical supply of cobalt and the ethical uh, mining of materials and processing and the sustainability becomes important as does polysilicon and polysilicon and how it is sourced and where it is sourced from and the the human rights and labor issues around polysilicon and the third part that i think is important and i think we'll talk more about this during the discussion today is on recyclability um, and when we advise clients about language to put in procurement contracts, we advise clients to make sure that the, for example, the module makers have gone through toxicity testing and that those reports are available and they have been used in certain uh, regional areas, in certain municipalities as evidence that solar is not going to leak bad things into the ground which are questions that come up from people who just don't know. So we, we make sure the supplier addresses that, we make sure the buyer is aware of it, and that the buyer has the tools to address any concerns that the public may have about solar, um, which is usually based on a, a lack of good information. In terms of recycling, the Solar Energy Industries Association in the US now offers I think seven different recyclers in the US that will recycle solar modules that have been vetted by the association. Two years ago, it was five. Five years ago, it was zero. 
So I think that's good progress in terms of having that infrastructure available. In the state of Washington, uh, there is producer responsibility that's been legislated and that has caused some solar module manufacturers to say, I will sell you my module, but don't you dare put it in Washington. I'd rather see the suppliers take some more responsibility and own up to the recycling uh, issues. And in California, there was some recycling legislation forwarded some years back that did not pass. But the recycling legislation was intended to say, you will recycle 100% of the materials in your module at the end of life. Uh, that failed, but California did recently pass a change in how modules are treated once they are at end of life. And now they are treated as what is called universal waste, whereas before modules could have been tested and potentially treated as hazardous waste. Universal waste makes it um, an easier end of life situation and especially for recycling. Okay, and talking about recycling, uh, I think we are there where your expertise is. So when you look at today's solar products, so what do you think could be improved from the viewpoint on, 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 of circularity? Um, I think, are we, are we good what's, what's in the module today? Well, in a good way. So uh, thank you, <laughs> Michael. So Rosie is a young company. We are dedicated to end of life PV model recycling. We have a focus on high purity in recycled raw materials. Certainly, the components and the architecture of the PV modules would play a very important role in the recyclability and the reintegration of different recycled raw materials. So today, more and more companies, as uh, many experts have said, look more and more at easy to recycle and carbon footprint as a criteria for product design. So therefore, for dedicated PV module recycling companies like Rosie, what could help us most to ramp up the activity, we are at the very beginning of an exponential curve, we believe, is that we could fast recognize the components, at least the basic information, such as type of back sheet, type of encapsulant, cell types, in a very transparent way. Ideally, also the geometric values on ribbons, on fingers, or composing materials for fingers, for solder, etc. So this relatively reasonable effort from the manufacturers will help us really to fast decide our process for recycling in order to have high yield with higher recycled values. Another interesting point I would like to share uh, from our practice is the economic profitability or economic return of recycling uh, is fairly different from broken and unbroken modules. Therefore, if we could make a collective effort either to optimize the design of the modules to increase their robustness or the design of dismantling procedures to reduce the amount of broken modules will surely have a remarkable increase in recycled values. So this is from our practice, what we see in the today's situation, how we could, how, how we could increase the uh, recyclability of the modules that reach their end of life on the market. Thank okay. you, Michael. Okay, thanks. I think we, we only have 10 more minutes. So I think let's let's really speed up. And so I think really go into uh, into a speed Q&A mode. Uh, I, I just um, asked them the questions and we rather do uh, short answers, almost uh, one sentence type answers. So when, when, when we look at, um, at uh, human rights, we have also chapters on human rights and supply chain transparency, um, um, in, transparency in, the, in the report. Has, has the solar industry as a whole done its homework uh, to make sure these two important topics are considered when procuring product? Paul has already mentioned that. So I think, um, Susanna, you're looking at that. Do you think we're, we're, we're good? Um, well, yes and no. I mean, um, I think we, we act when we have the information. So, um, for example, we are not using cobalt in, our, in the battery selections that we're making. Um, but And we've taken very seriously the, the um, news reports that have come out around polysilicon. And I think as an industry, we've really responded very quickly to that and very, you know, in, in a very concerned way. And certainly if I speak for Statcraft, we've you know, a lot of people have been involved in um, 
trying to think out what is our response to this and we've taken quite a tough stance but I'm actually interested in Paul's view on this because I know he's witnessed some differences in the way that the that European companies have responded to this particular issue versus the way that American companies have responded and I, I think it's an interesting area. So I'll jump in. Um, nobody wants forced labor uh, and forced labor is an element that's really important in terms of human rights and the United States has had prohibitions against bringing anything into the country with forced labor since 1930 but the, the world is changing and right now there's obviously as Susanna just pointed out a, a focus on human rights and forced labor issues that are alleged to be happening in western China where most of the world's polysilicon is produced so uh, there is a difference in terms of what we see as ways of addressing this in the United States versus Europe in the United States, uh, thanks to leadership of the Industry Association, there's now a traceability protocol, which at least if followed by suppliers and recommended by buyers, establishes provenance. Where did the materials come from? And through that, you can demonstrate that materials perhaps did not come from this particular region. But I see the European approach as being somewhat different. The European approach is more a matter of how do we not just avoid sourcing where forced labor comes from, but how do we get rid of forced labor throughout the entire supply chain? It's, I would say, more of a solution-oriented approach that's long-term, more strategic uh, than the, the sort of important and tactical near-term steps being taken in the U.S. Okay. Um... Um, so let's, we have a couple of themes I, I would really at least like to touch. So, so Andreas, when, um, what, when we, we look at the global solar industry, so, and we see this cost pressure once again, I think you, First Solar has been also active in the past, at least a lot in project development. How, how can we make sure that there's more and more emphasis on sustainable products and, um, and then actually also on development, maybe if we directly jump into that? Yeah, I think that the, the, the pressure to embark on more sustainable practices, and I think Susanna made a very, very good point, it should, should, should be visible not only through um, an LCOA uh, calculation, but, you know, we need to make sure that these other factors are Spacked into you know the RFQs, um, the request for proposal, also also public procurement, so that um, you know the uh, the different other parts of the of the supply chain can actually react to that, right? And that's that's what I what I feel you know can already be done. I mean, we have a leadership standard in the industry. Um, we have an EP equal label which addresses these various dimensions of sustainability in a multi criteria approach. And the more this is being taken up by the developer community, the more the industry will adapt to that, right? And 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 Paul made a very very good point on France, right? When they introduced an embodied carbon criterion almost a decade ago, they they basically you know started that that discussion and and see now everybody can actually you know provide that information and that there is some granularity in there. Um, which we haven't seen in, in many other of these of these areas as well. So I think it really has to be a pull effect, and we see that especially in the CNI space, corporate and industrial space, where um, you know purchases are, are you know already way beyond just purchasing the megawatt of clean electricity. They are really looking at the electron. They want to understand, okay, what's in there? How can I maximize the impact? Um, the positive impact from purchasing that electricity? And I think that that's really what we need to we need to promote further and uh, again i mean we, we are at a record low kind of cost level already um so um just driving this based on uh, on cost perspective only will be will be not sufficient we need to have a pull effect for for these kind of initiatives okay thanks maybe let's touch also quickly also on public acceptance because i think that's also a topic we cover in that report and in that in that, in that context, also bio, 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 biodiversity, because what we have to see is simply we will deploy gigawatts, terawatts in the end, many, many terawatts in our 100% re renewable Europe report. We talk about 7.7 terawatts for Europe, actually, by 2050. So 
how, how can we make sure that when we plan and design solar systems for public acceptance, that we avoid a large uh, not in my backyard movement? Well, can I respond to that? So I think that sure. communication is absolutely key. So being transparent, being open, listening to the feedback that you're getting, all of that is absolutely essential. Um, it's important to provide opportunities for that local community and to respond to what there is important to them. Is it jobs? Um, we're going to be using a lot of the hospitality lo locally. Uh, is it about um, supporting local local projects, local charities, etc.? Um, all of those things are important, particularly jobs, particularly um, making sure that you are presenting a very credible, um, a very credible approach and a, from a very credible company. And they have to have trust that you're going to build this project responsibly. But I think one of the things that is actually universal, doesn't matter whether you're in the Netherlands, Spain, UK, Italy, wherever. One of the things that is universally important is how you address biodiversity and um, to put forward a plan that is going to improve biodiversity at that site is just universally attractive. Something that that connects um, to people is around um, creating an opportunity for plants, creating an opportunity for wildlife. And the, there is something about that that brings people emotionally closer to the project. So I think that is something that is it is required in certain countries. But what we found is that even when it's not required, we've been we've been pursuing high levels of um, of uh, biodiversity in our projects and it's always, always welcome. So I would strongly recommend that that is always part of, of, of any kind of large large scale project, along with obviously support for the local community. Okay, I could talk with you about this for hours. We're coming to an end, but I would like to have maybe one final question, one sentence to everyone. So we at Solar Power Europe are obviously a lobby association. And so what 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 are our key policy asks or um, when it comes to solar sustainability? So I think um, um, what, maybe Andreas, maybe one sentence first, Paul also, you and Susanna. So one sentence what do you think is the key message we we have to have to convey when it comes to sustainability and solar andreas maybe you first i was a mute um i think um ensuring accountability across the supply chain um and uh, a level playing field that's that's the first and main ask i would have uh, and okay. For me, it's it's not about a push message, but it's more of a pull. Let's pull everybody together on the buying side. Let's pull everybody together on the supplying side. That this really matters. Uh, we we must be ethical. We must think about the whole supply chain. We must think about transparency. Up to you, Susanne. Yep. So I would definitely support Paul's view. We need to work together, but also let's let's make sure that biodiversity is always first and foremost to, to, as a used as a means to speed up and and create acceptance. And I would like to call for a booster for the technology and the innovation for high value recycling to avoid downcycling but uh, upcycling to lead to a real circular economy for a PV industry. Okay, I think that's a great last statement. I think we go back to Valborga so that we can really soon discuss actually some interesting projects in our sustainability award session. Thanks to everyone uh, for your valuable comments. You. I enjoyed it very much. And again, thank you and back to Valborga. Thank Thanks you. very much, Michael. Thanks to all of you. It was super exciting listening uh, to you and deep dive with you on sustainability. Thanks also to you for joining us in this session. So next and very last on our agenda uh, is of our Solar Power Summit is our first Solar Sustainability Awards. And uh, we will bring to you our great finalists and also some uh, inspiration from a modern adventurer. So stay tuned. You will have a last wellness break now, um, approximately 20 minutes, 30 minutes until we start. So hopefully see you back in a couple of minutes.